You're listening to Abyss Gazing, a horror podcast where we celebrate all things spooky and mental health. I'm your co-host, Mark. And I'm your other co-host, Josh. And we have Rob and Lori from the Fright Stuff with us today to talk about the Abyss. Hi, everyone. Hi. So before we start talking about this debatable, questionable horror movie, Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna this is this is Silence of the Lambs all over again. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the uh, the Fright Stuff podcast. You want to go, Rob? Uh, sure. So uh, Lori and I started the Fright Stuff podcast uh, last year. Um, we did a, a test couple of a uh, couple of episodes. Um, we're a monthly podcast that talks about uh, pretty much all things horror, um, a lot of stuff local to Winchester, but movies, uh, themes, things like that. Um, we just uh, have a lot of fun with it. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. <laughs> we just like to talk, basically. Really, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, hour and a half long phone conversation that we're just uh, leaving on record. <laughs> what i think is really interesting about your guys's podcast is uh essentially like how you guys go about doing each each topic uh so mandy was the most recent episode you guys did and mandy was like the first film that you guys have really truly like singular dissected Mm -hmm. um and where did the idea come from to focus more on the genres and or kind of like a grouping of films as opposed to a singular film so I think we both decided pretty early on that there are so many, you know, horror podcasts. I listen to a ton of them. Um, and I think we just wanted to make sure that we covered subjects that we enjoyed and not kind of limit ourselves to films. We knew we would do singular films. We had started with Midsummer because we just, that's our starting jump off point. And we just basically come up with a list of what interests us. And like Rob said, sometimes it's focused on something local. Sometimes it's, you know, seasonal. Sometimes it's a film. So it's just kind of whatever we're in the mood for. And yeah. it just happened that Mandy was very polarizing for the two of us. So we decided so it was that midsummer. was <laughs> <laughs> no, midsummer. Yeah. So well, that's polarizing for everybody. But yeah. And uh, one of the other things we wanted to do is, um, and Lori kind of explained it, it's not really box ourselves in with just one thing to talk about. Because with a movie, I mean, yeah, you can talk about the plot and things like that. And some movies have a ton of trivia about them. Sometimes they don't. um, And we didn't really want it to be a movie review kind of thing. Um, But certain films, like Mandy, just have so much to talk about. Not even really related to the plot just everything that was around that surrounds it um that it just it just kind of spoke it spoke to Lori more than me but uh <laughs> um uh and also uh there uh you know if people ever listen to the episode there's a history with mandy uh and and i uh because i hated that movie for the longest time and i was forced to watch it several times and then finally agreed to watch it voluntarily once <laughs> That's yeah, I well together. I I've watched it once, and I wasn't on drugs, but felt like I should have been. Yes, <laughs> and then you that means you did right because if you if you don't watch that film and feel like you're on drugs, then then there's you're, you're just not living your best life. I I will say maybe because I was three uh, bold rocks in, and that last showing maybe that's why I liked it a little bit more. I don't know. I don't know. It's what, it's an insane movie. movie. Uh, I I would be curious. I would be curious to hear your thoughts on on Possessor because Possessor is very similar in that vein. I have not seen it. I've been told to watch it. Um, I actually did a painting of it um, uh, on my uh, former uh, other paint show. And uh, the person who had asked for it was like, you have to see this movie. You have to see this movie. I still have not watched it. But I do know it's the same actress from Mandy, right? Yeah. Uh, Andrea Riseborough, I think is how you say her last name. Yeah. 
Yeah, I keep I, co- I keep coming across it, but haven't watched that one yet. Maybe we need to do it like an, another like episode with you guys. We just talk about this answer. <laughs> oh sure. Um, I mean, I, I I don't mind watching movies. And gosh, uh, around uh, Psycho Cinema, gosh, they they show the the weirdest stuff. <laughs> they really do. No. In a good way. I mean, I like some of the odd, weird stuff that you don't that, that aren't major Hollywood. Some of the weird stuff is the more fun stuff. We keep trying to do an episode on on Psycho Gorman, but we keep losing our guests for it. Really? Oh my god, <laughs> that movie's amazing. <gasps> Rob Space. <laughs> oh, I love that movie so much. It's, Same. Power Rangers fan all the way. <laughs> and if that's not a horror movie straight out of Power Rangers, I don't know what is. A love letter, a love letter to Power Rangers. Yeah. And Hunky Boys. If you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My Hunky Boys. <laughs> For the Hunky Boys. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, it's so kind of getting back to it so doing genre stuff and like picking like a theme like when we did folk uh horror movies and stuff like that um it it also allows us to hear about movies we'd never even heard of before because we'll do research and we'll be like what the hell is this movie and then we'll go watch it and we're like oh my god that was really good yeah so well i mean our first episode doing abyss gazing was on the original christopher lee wicker man oh uh, nope, wonderful nope. you it was no. Ghoulies, my friend. It was, that's right. It was Ghoulies. Second episode was Wicker Man. Sorry. My bad. And Fade was on the Ghoulies episode. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, God. I yeah. listened to that. Mm-hmm. I did yeah. listen to that. But yeah, we did, we did the Wicker Man, and it's borderline musical. It's completely batshit crazy. And for all intents and purposes, it's like the original Midsummer. I Absolutely. mean, that scene with the chick dancing through the wall, like naked through the wall, and he's up. <laughs> I just I, every time I will stop that and rewind it like twenty times because it is so bizarre. But I love it. I do. That whole that whole movie is bizarre. Yeah. So yeah, we we hit all over the board with with us and different movies, um, and a lot of them. It's fun for me because I grew up with a lot of these, and he's like, I've never seen this, so yeah. it's it's great. It's a great dynamic. <laughs> And then I get to talk about being an old bastard. So <laughs> the, the one uh, the one movie no one will ever hear us talk about because we did a test uh, podcast just to see how it would work out. We both talked about Love Actually, and I still think it was the, my, the most fun I've ever had talking about a movie because, oh, my God, that movie's nuts, but I love it. Um, not a your- horror themed podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't, but I, I, you know, we can make an exception for around Christmas time because it does horrify a lot of people. I don't it, know if you could does. do like, you could do Christmas, right. you could do like a Valentine's Day special. I mean, you could spin it multiple <laughs> different ways. That's probably true. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of first times watch watches, it would also include the movie we're here talking about today, which is arguably one of Mark's favorite films favorite. it's it's easy in my top three so oh, really? the thing with the abyss is some there are some groups and people that for some weird reason categorize it as or don't know how i made that disclaimer when we talked about recording this episode <laughs> but it's just it was such a good movie and so far ahead of its time when it came out the um James Cameron created certain software for certain scenes. And this is just like Tron came out in 1980 and was the first big CG movie. And then this came out in 88 was that big of a jump for some of the computer effects that they had that it influenced future movies to come just from the stuff he developed to do special effects in the movie. It, yeah, I don't think I ever would have even ever suggested that this was a horror movie i mean it's a sci-fi movie no no doubt but it's not really scary it's yeah there's nothing horror about it and i i told him it was like look can can we do this for like an episode of uh victims and villains or something and he's like no we'll do it for a best case because (laughs) he's seen some, some places have categorized it as a horror and it's like well maybe they're on crack i don't know but 
we're here and that's what we're doing today. I mean, <laughs> well, I have, like, if you had like a really, really deep rooted fear of underwater shit, maybe you would find it scary. I mean, I wouldn't want to put myself in the situation these people are in in this film, but I still don't consider that horror. I just consider that like no. bad, bad life choices. <laughs> <laughs> I I think with this episode, it, it allows us to open the doors to uh, also do sci-fi uh, because this is, and I said this on, on our, ep, again, Silence of the Lambs episode, I don't consider that like horror that is kind of like to me, that's like a thriller with horror elements at best. Um, see, Mark, I'm not alone. Both of them, both our guests shook their heads. Let the record show. Which is great for a podcast because everyone can hear it. <laughs> That's why I got to tell people what's happening. <laughs> got to narrate it. Uh, but I, I think that like this one in particular opens up that door for conversations for saying, okay, there are horror adjacent elements in this. Like Laura was saying, like you can definitely fear the you know the underwater, the unknown. Because I think that's something at the end of the day that all of us fear is the unknown. Um, and if you classified this as a, as technically as a as a horror movie, it wouldn't be the first time James Cameron actually has done a horror movie with yeah, aliens. I was gonna say aliens. Oh yeah, that too. I wouldn't call aliens a horror movie at all. That's an action movie. That is a sci-fi action. Alien horror. Aliens is still my favorite, but that's an action movie. I mean, that's that's Predator. That, that's all that is. Some, I mean, I, some people would disagree with you, though. I guess that's true. I, I guess that's true. I don't know. I that's a sci-fi action movie to me. I yeah. I don't know. I think I think we can all safely say all four of us because I know we're all horror fans. I think we can all safely say that horror adjacent has become like so muddy because they will if they don't know what to do with a film they'll just throw it into horror so, <laughs> so we, we get <laughs> whatever we get the drag we get everything so well it's I mean, kind of like it's so kind of like kind of like calling a certain bands metal yeah. metal is such a huge topic and even half the stuff on the radio now on like a rock channel they're like oh this metal band it's like no it's not well, we didn't know what to classify them, so they're metal. It's like this is this is heavy. Way. It's got to be metal. Yeah, I don't know where else you would put the Temptations. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, The Abyss is a good movie. It's just it's a sci-fi. I, I don't know why you would take that away from sci-fi. I mean, it's yeah, it's so deeply written. And it was copied so much into horror movies, yeah. which is yeah. funny. Yeah. I mean, they turned around very shortly thereafter and put out like Leviathan and Deep Star Six. And yep. um, I think another one called The Rift came out right about that time. So, yeah, it, gonna, it had its impact. So, oh yeah, I'm going to open up this for two things and apologize in advance to all three of you. Uh, because A, I'm going to show my age very early in this podcast because this movie... Disney Channel ruined this movie for me. And I will explain why in just a few minutes. God. Uh, yep. See, look, there it goes. Disney uh, Channel. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I was always going to apologize. Yeah, no, there was a there was a movie that came out. There was this series of, of Disney Disney produced movies that they would do exclusively for the, the Disney Channel. Mm-hmm. I grew up on them. It was part of my generation. And uh, yeah, they... Uh, they did a movie that pretty much ripped out the entire twist of this movie for theirs. And so by the time I saw the abyss, cause this was the first time viewing for me, I was like, that's the monster from Xenon. Come on. <laughs> and you watch the theatrical cut, right? I did because the director's cut is not streaming anywhere. And uh, Disney is trying to hide it. So right now, Cameron has confirmed that there are complete full remasters done of The Abyss, I think Eraser, and a couple other of his older movies. Um, he's And he signed off on them. That was part of the issue they were having. And he was just too busy doing Avatar stuff. Um, I think Avatar's on the list too. 
So the rumor is that they're supposed to be coming out later this year, but the more kind of in the know or saying probably shortly after Avatar 2 comes out, they're going to be re-releasing remasters of uh, HD and UHD versions of The Abyss and a handful of his movies. The Abyss never even got a Blu-ray release though, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So, nope. nope. I mean, crazy. It's really, really hard to find because I watched it recently so I didn't really need a rewatch for this, but I, I had some time over the weekend. I was like, well, I'll put it on while I'm doing some other stuff. I couldn't find it anywhere to rewatch on anything that I saw. <laughs> it is only streaming exclusively on stars. I did find for that. And I was like, you know, if I sign up for stars, I'm going to have one more streaming service that I do not watch. So I didn't do it. But is that it? That's crazy. That's that's I, it. I know. I, I was like, I, I couldn't believe it when I was like on Just Watch. I'm like going through stuff. I'm like, like you can't even rent like it's either you, you rent it or you get you get stars i'm just like uh, uh, I, why i had no problem finding leviathan and underwater so <laughs> i did watch those um but no i mean i've seen the abyss quite a few times uh my family's big into sci-fi um but yeah no i couldn't find it either <laughs> i don't have I've... a stars account so I have owned the movie, the special edition that's got the theatrical cut and the director's cut for probably 20 years. And I've had the same copy that somehow I've managed never to ruin. And the director's <laughs> cut has the whole like tidal wave stuff, right? I've heard of it. Right. I've never seen it. Yeah. There's so the big difference is there's a couple little small scenes like at this point, if you haven't seen the movie, we're going to ruin it for you because that's what we do. Um, Spoiler alert. <laughs> 1989, but, folks. <laughs> it's your fault Spoiler at this alert. point. <laughs> uh, but there's there's a scene just after the crane comes down. They've kind of stopped as much flooding and everything as they can. And you see, it's not Catfish. It's one of the other side characters is sitting there calling an SOS back to the surface and Ed Harris comes in and they start talking and it's a completely ad lib scene that was cut from the theatrical release and it's in the director's cut. So that scene's like five or 10 minutes, but the majority of the cut stuff that's in the director's cut is a lot more conversation with the aliens at the end the whole tidal wave scene and all of that and then the rest of the like 30 minutes extra or whatever it is 25 minutes is just little things here and there but the majority of it makes up those two scenes and that end scene the way they cut it down because he cut an entire storyline to make it fit the theaters um, it's basically the aliens have been here as observers the whole time and they're tired of watching humanity destroy itself why would you cut that though? Like that was all of that to me. Like it makes the story flow so, so much better. This is pre Terminator two. It was, okay. that's really where it was like, <clears throat> here's all the money. James Cameron, do what you want. And uh, was Terminator two. So he actually said it, it was interesting. So I, I, I looked at like all these like facts and things about it. He's come out and said that the, that he had final cut and he decided I'm going to cut out this. And the studios were terrified that he cut out the tidal wave scene. They're like, this is great. Why would you do that? And he's like, we don't need it. It's fine. I really but, wonder if this would have been a financial success if he had left it as his cut. So it wasn't quite a flop. It made back its money. It did. But it wasn't like, aliens or any of his other movies making just like bag mm -hmm. um it's actually one of his lesser known movies more people yeah. know about terminators and aliens and everything else than they do about the abyss so the uh the the box office return for this was uh domestically was 54.4 uh, million um, worldwide, it grossed ninety million, uh, and it's been released in theaters originally in 1989, 1993, and then it also it did a international re-release in Australia in 2020. Um, but the things that people also have to consider about budgets is that um, 
you know, it had a budget of 43 million. So it essentially broke even because that 43 yeah. million is you're paying for the actors, the movie itself. You essentially have to double that budget in order to uh, factor in marketing, television spots and everything like that. So they say if you want to see if a film's a financial success or not, you essentially have to double its budget and then see it. So it it made like pennies essentially yeah. versus like what they actually put into it. But it's it, have you looked at any of the background of the movie, Josh? Like the background as how in... they how they made stuff and did scenes. It's no I, yeah, it's it's insane. If there was a vessel that could hold water, he probably taped in it for this movie. They had scenes like the submarine scenes. So uh, the whole point of the movie, if somebody's listening that hasn't seen this, it's an underwater drilling platform, oil drilling platform that has been brought in to try to rescue possible survivors of a submarine accident. And they don't know what caused the accident yet. So you've got scenes, ocean floor, in the rig. You've got people on ships. I mean, it's, it's got multiple fairly complicated scenes. But you have, like, when they go in to search for possible survivors in the sub, um, they had so much chlorine in the water. It was, like, bleaching people's hair. It was eating through their wetsuits. It was dissolving the glue in some of the sets. So by the time they were done recording with that specific sets, there was like pieces just floating around and like cloudy from glue dissolved in it and stuff. Oh, oh yeah, it was it was a nightmare. Uh, they had like, what was it? I believe it was like a cooling tank from a um, deactivated like power plant or something or a water, something huge. It was what? The size what? of a football field. Yeah, it was a nuclear power plant in South Carolina, the size of a football field, and they filled it with like, what was it, like seven million gallons of water or something? Yeah, um, did, did. and it was open air. So when he filmed, he really wanted like that murky kind of dark. So he couldn't put like a pool cover on it or anything because you know, God forbid something should happen, he wanted anybody to drown. So they ended up floating like these dark plastic beads on top to give it like a really dark color. I can't imagine going to work like, hey, we're gonna go film this, you know, film. And that, ha the, so we talked about this movie not being horror. If, if you were an actor, <laughs> yeah, I would absolutely agree that this was a horror to film. I mean, it was just, I don't do well in, like if I'm at the beach, I'll, I'm cold to my, my knees, y'all. I'm cold to my knees. Like anything past <laughs> that, I know that Bruce is going to come up and grab me and shake me and I'm going to die. And it's, that's it. So like filming in a, in a nuclear core, like a big, I can't, I just can't, a containment tank. I'm, I, I don't know. What, you know. I, so when I read about it and, and you're right on, Ed Harris refused to talk about the movie afterwards. He said it was so grueling. One time he pulled over after filming, he's driving home. He pulls over on the side of the road and just breaks down crying. I think um, multiple actors in this film have. Yeah. Well, and what's her name? Mary, um, Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio. She, she like walked off and almost quit during the resuscitation scene. Mm -hmm. Because Ed Harris got so into the park trying to revive her character, she she got pissed off and walked off set, and, and they thought she was quitting. I think they also ran out of film on that scene, so he's he's like abusing her. <laughs> she's laying there, you know, dead with her girls out, and the I think he, I think I read somewhere that Ed um, knew that the film had had stopped. But nobody called cut, so he's like, all right, I'm professional, I'll keep on going. And when she found out, she's like, no, F y'all. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on here. I won't, because nobody else. <laughs> but, um, she's just like, no, this is weird. You're treating us like like animals, basically. Yeah. And, and James Cameron almost killed Ed Harris. He's drowning. Yeah. And Ed Harris is like, or Ed, uh, James Cameron's like, keep filming. Let's, say, let's take a look at this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ed Harris gets saved, 
gets out and reportedly punched him in the face. Just punched James Cameron in the face. Yeah, they and- had it was what during the dive scene at the end to tape it. The helmet's actually full of colored liquid. Mm-hmm. And they were towing him in circles around the tank to make it look like he was falling. And they had emergency divers just out of screen that every so often they would stop and rush in and take the helmet off and give him air so he could breathe. And he almost drowned multiple times during tapings of that scene. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen Leap of Face, uh, the, the William Freakin documentary yeah. on The Exorcist. Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> I... There are some things that you just don't do to your actors on set because it it messes with their mental health. And as someone that is very advocate for healthy work environments and also does a network of podcasts revolving around the subject, you have to understand that like that creates incredible tense work environment. So the fact that, you know, this isn't considered technically a horror movie, the, the the making of this movie definitely sounds like it is a horrific event. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, even after learning some of this now, you may not have known Josh. It no. makes the movie that much more impressive, doesn't it? If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. You can also text HELP to 741-741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please, if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please, consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because... Once again, you have value and you have worth. So please stay with us. I mean, there, there are many though. accounts. <laughs> oh, don't, don't be that guy. <laughs> so, I mean, even like the water tentacle, he had to figure out a way to do the water tentacle. And he created the software and programs that were later used to um, create the liquid Terminator and Terminator 2 the start of it was that scene right there and creating the software to animate that water tentacle, which was later used to animate Dude Man and Terminator 2. I have a question about this that maybe you can confirm for me. Apparently the water tentacle, he worked in conjunction with with Industrial Light and Magic Island, right? Very expensive. I believe so. Okay, so at a certain point, I understand that they, you know, this film obviously was probably way not over budget, but over schedule, you know, or or whatever. But I think at one point they had to switch to DreamWorks, which was a little less expensive. Um, But I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure. So I was hoping you could confirm that as far as special effects go, because I mean, the, the movie, the special effects are good. But that water tentacle always sticks out to people. Like if you've only seen the movie once, you know that scene because it was yeah. so kind of just, you know, for the time, like you said, what, eight years out from Tron. Just like Tron. Brand. Yeah. But yeah. Tron was like, oh, you know, the business. But I don't so, so what I know about that is I know they were having 
trouble figuring it out. And because of that, James Cameron rewrote the script so that if that scene didn't work and it looked like shit. Oh, pardon, pardon my French. I'm sorry. I don't know. If oh, I'm you're fine. Oh, you're, you're good. good. You're fine. Okay. Um, so if it looked bad, he could cut it and the movie would still be OK. So that scene, if you actually look at it, nothing in that scene is so necessary that the movie wouldn't still work without it because they were terrified it was going to look terrible. Well, it's funny if you look at the taping of the scene, they use a piece of like uh, pieces of like duct work as oh, that as was, the that what they're acting to like duct yeah. work. Like this yeah, little... they had like a piece of flexible uh, tubing that they were had somebody standing there with and manipulating, and that's what they were reacting with. Rea- well, I'd uh, rather have seen with. that. That might have been cooler. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it is one of my favorite scenes in the film, not for the special effects, but for the fact that ain't nobody need to be sticking their finger in the alien <laughs> face and then putting it in there. Nobody. I'm sorry. But that gets me every time. I'm like, why would you do that? So that's yeah. all. Yeah. It uh may- maybe that film was going in a completely different direction. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, you, you got to leave it open abyss, for the, the X-rated X cut. Yeah, you got to leave it open for that <laughs> X-rated parody that's going to come out. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I mean, it's from a recording aspect, it was just amazing what they did with it. I mean, even the even the subs, he put little like screens in the model subs that's how they taped them going around like the sub the the crash sub the little mini submersibles had little screens in the front of them showing the actors portraying the part of piloting the sub while they maneuvered them around the uh model crash sub it's crazy i mean yeah. regardless how you feel about james cameron he the man i mean he i think a lot of times like, perfectly honest i think a lot of times his films are way overdone like I, I, in, in kind of researching for this, I understand they're doing four more avatars. I don't know why, but. Is it four now? I thought it was three. Uh, there will be money. Five. Well, money, and yeah. I mean, I'm money. Thinking, but, oh my God. I, I just, it, the but, only thing I remember about Avatar is that, I mean, I saw it. I couldn't tell you what the, it, blue people, tall, whatever. Um, the special effects, I think, were kind of at the time when everybody was focused on, and that's why the big draw and everybody went to see it. I don't think we need four yeah. more, but that's me. Um, I, but man does know. I know he's, by all accounts, a jackass and not a very nice dude to work for because he will, you know, all the various things we just talked about, but um, definitely has his place in, in kind of film history for some of the things that he's figured out and some of the things that he's done. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And like, I'm not the biggest James Cameron fan. Like I, out of probably his filmography, like Terminator one and two are the only movies I'll come back to just time and time again, because they're just phenomenal, almost flawless movies. But like, uh, I know that like people love aliens, alien the alien franchise is is okay i'm not the big sci-fi guy that's mark are Um, are you okay are you okay i am i might be sick i don't know uh (laughs) but yeah like to Lori's point like i I don't understand the point of why we need more avatar movies like the, the world at this point it just feels like five to seven years a little bit too late um I, I but, do think that I think the sequels aren't going to do as well as they're hoping simply oh, because no. they took too long to put them out. And is yes. anybody really actually asking for them or is that just James Cameron being like, I'm James Cameron, bitch, and making movies? Because, so, well, I'm wondering heard, how much of it is him trying to be an environmentalist and, and doing that, it. That, that too, he does always tend to have some kind of a message, which I mean, I saw his Mariana Trench whatever he did the, the that thing was fascinating and the documentary was, it was great yeah. something like that instead if he wants to get that kind of message across i feel like it would be better to do something more along that line than yeah you know, he did a he did a couple of those documentaries he did the did. mariana trench one he did one i think involving the bismarck and i think he did another one for the titanic yeah yep. you do something like that if you want to get your message out there because that was great 
the man's got a fascination with the ocean. I mean, he really does. First movies, Piranha 2. Yeah. <laughs> he, does, he does The Abyss. He does Titanic. Yeah, he does those two documentaries, which I think, yeah, the Bismarck's in, involved too. Then he's like, all right, let's take Avatar underwater now too. Like, it's cool, man. Just. Oh, he's, just... he's very open about his fascination with the sea. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, out of everything that's on the planet, like the ocean is the, like the one place to fear because of how deep it is and because how frighteningly little of it we actually know. Mm-hmm. Like, so the fact that he wants to go and make all these like, these these movies and documentaries around it like i'm all for it and not yeah. to come up on my hippie soapbox but it it, it probably is not going to hurt anything to bring a little bit of, ten- of attention to the fact that we really need to kind of you know clean some things up so then I'm down. yeah I'm down. can't bit. he just make a sequest movie then please can we reboot that <laughs> franchise yes <sighs> give it to me <laughs> but yeah, for some reason, The Abyss has always been in my top, like, probably top three favorite movies ever. I think so, learning about the background did help too, because I think yeah. rewatching it will be a whole different thing. Yeah, yeah. so I, I will, I will go off of what Lori was just saying. Like, I think that learning about this movie has been fascinating, and as if you guys have been listening to our show for any amount of time or any, uh, Mark and I have differing sort of opinions sometimes. Sometimes we're right on the ball and sometimes we're just very different. And, and the, this is, is the future. Uh, I loved crimes of the future. Uh, the, this one is another polarizing thing for, for both of us because uh, I, I can respect the mess out of how this movie was made and the crew and everything that they had to endure and not necessarily like the final product. And that's kind of where I lie with this movie. I think that this movie has fascinating BTS information behind it. And it breaks my heart that all of the cast and crew went through the things that they went through on this one. But at the end of the day, like this probably was just not my cup of tea. Can, can I ask a question, Josh, since it was your first watch? Sure. Do you, do you feel like it was a bit dated? Do you think it holds up well? Like if you had seen it today, not knowing when it was made... Would you have known that it was from 89, 88, 89? Honestly, like I didn't know it was from 89 until after I watched it because I originally thought that it was from uh, like the mid 90s because I'd always seen like this in like blockbusters and like uh, like video rental stores we would we would come into um, growing up. And I always thought the cover was like really cool. Like it's that that silhouette of um I don't know which character it is just kind of like chilling there in the helmet. Like that's iconic. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say that I think that for the most part, the effects hold up fairly well. Um, I think that a large portion of even without the effects, like just the simplicity of the story, it presents this very timeless tale. I'm just, I don't know. I was bored by this movie. (laughs) Sorry, Mark. This hurts me. It hurts me so much. You're, 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 you're not alone, Josh. The movie's fine, <laughs> but yeah, it's not. It's not as. It's not. It's not an exciting James Cameron movie. Yeah. Um, it's well, just it's not, not the typical James Cameron. It's it's different from his other movies. I I'd agree. Um, the the one thing I will say is, it it impacted so many others i mean we talked about it at the beginning about how many other movies but like look at the plot of armageddon i mean that took so many plot points from the abyss to the one guy going crazy uh, the fact that it's a drilling team like i mean it's it's insane um so a lot of a lot of sci-fi movies borrowed from this so it's just kind of it's important but yeah i mean it's it's not super exciting uh it's it's just not it's not sphere Gosh. I think. Go ahead, Lori. I'm just here for Michael. Uh, Michael Bond. Yeah. <laughs> oh man! Uh, so I'm like I think, the only one that's a big fan of this movie. Out of the. I think of us. for me. I'm go ahead, Lori. Lu- I'm I'm in the lukewarm. lukewarm. I'm not. I'm not. So I, I'm thinking I'm just right above. But just because I've seen it, so I'm going to blow everybody's mind here. I think the very first time I saw this was in the theater when it was released in 1989. (laughs) 
I remember going to That's see fair. it with my mom. I, I was five. So I, I don't know if I saw it or not. I might have. Well, I was I was in high school, Rob, you feed us. So <sighs> I graduated Sorry. in 1990. So I was, you know, I was in the movie going, you know, time of my life. I was a teenager and I saw it in the theater for the first time. And I remember being very impressed with the, and I didn't know at the time, I didn't know James Cameron from anybody. I just remember the water, you know, face scene and I remember the special effects and um just the bigness of it I guess but I I I really the scope I'm really hoping that when they do the re-release of uh, the HD versions that they do a theater re-release for like a special engagement or something because I think I was 10 or 11 when I saw it the first time and it was on HBO on the special feature presentation premiere night on Saturdays on HBO. And that was the first time I ever saw it. And typically it was right around two years after a movie left the theater that it showed up on HBO. So it was probably around 91, 92 when I first saw it. And I've been watching it ever since. I remember those good old days. And I can hear the, the HBO song. Yeah. <laughs> I can hear that. That that's probably where I first saw it. I seem to remember seeing it on UPN at one time, but I might have saw it on HBO. Uh, yeah, every I was, time I would find it on, I would watch it, and my parents were like, "Oh my god, not again!" <laughs> oh no. <laughs> there was a handful was, of movies that were like that. That was one of them. Uh, Gremlins was on that list. There was a couple of them. Every time I found them on, I would watch them, and my parents hated me for it. Well, I was 31 and I signed up for a free trial of stars. <laughs> First time I saw it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. yeah, I for me, the, the movie that I watched over and over it was either House or Tremors. My mom rented House. Tremors hundreds of times. It was insane how many times she ordered that movie. From Errol's video Errol. back in the day. Y'all are killing me. <laughs> um one of the things that I, I think when you when you talk about this movie is that it's it's very dialogue heavy like uh Rob was saying it's not very it's it, no, it's not exciting like traditional like camera movie around this time and I think a part of the reason that like again I feel like dialogue movies are very like hit or miss with most audiences True. and like I I have some like dialogue heavy movies in in my list like the the stylist last year was very dialogue heavy um it was my favorite film of last year uh promise young woman also the year before was my favorite film very dialogue heavy um and one of my favorite films of all time is for as divisive as it is is rob zombies halloween 2 while it is while it does have a brutality to it there's a lot of dialogue in there and so it's a very slow burn and so i think that like you have to necessarily like either grow up with it the way that you did Mark and to, to truly appreciate it or you have to really be a fan of the genre. Sure. I mean, I, I do, I do kind of want to just kind of touch quickly on the fact that I think that Cameron does write all of his dialogue. And I think he was going through a nasty divorce with the, I can't remember her name, but she worked on the film um, because it, it came up a lot in research that, speaking of dialogue, that they called uh, Lindsay a bitch a lot. Like, it, they, they were yeah. very, but by all accounts, she's not. Like, the rest queen, of the crew really queen seems Queen bitch like her. of the universe. Yes, the rest of the crew really seems to like her. They seem to respect her. They know that she had a big part in um, whatever she had to do. She built, didn't she build some, some kind of something on the sub? What did she do? She designed the rig. There you go. She designed the rig. Yeah. So, you know, but I guess because he was going through what he was going through, that came up a lot. Um, so dialogue is important. Um, I don't take any offense to it. I mean, and she didn't either. By the end of the film, she calls herself a cast iron bitch or something. I don't yeah. know. She it. And I, I, as a woman, I feel like that's the proper thing to do. That's uh, apparently the exact same story of uh, Cutthroat Island. Gina Davis and the director were getting a divorce, so he yeah. was purposely oh, making things difficult for her. 
Or yes, life. but did it end her career like it did Gina Davis? Oh. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, parent, so her parent, apparently Gail Ann Hurd, uh, so is the she's she's done a ton. And she was also involved in Tremors. Executive producer, I just found out. Sorry, I'm <laughs> cheating. I'm looking at get my computer. I just found that out. And she did probably one of the best uh one of the best animal movies ever, The Ghost in the Darkness. So, wow, she's done a ton. Good, good for her. Apparently wow, she I've never heard of this person. Had old Jimmy Cameron hacking, and he did not take it well. So, I I will say for for as kind of as much as I didn't really as middle of the line of this movie as I am, I really did enjoy the Bud Lindsay dynamic. I think that, you know, when you talk about things from a, a scope of mental health, which we do here, that's such a, a prevalent point because it really stretches, stresses the point of making sure that you are with somebody that is going to be good for you and good for your mental health at the end of the day. Um, because we kind of see throughout the journey of, you know, yes, they get the happy ending and kind of hearing the trivia behind that. It makes sense why they get that the, at the happy ending now, but also at the same time, like you kind of see that toxicity back, <laughs> excuse me, back and forth throughout the entirety of the thing. And it just kind of really stresses the point of like, you know, if you're going to marry someone and spend the rest of your life or even be in a committed relationship with someone, make sure that it's going to be uh, a healthy mental health, part for both parties involved well she makes the comment um they get in part of their argument uh and early in the movie uh he makes the comment to her that um she's got three years into the rig but only two years into him and she responds with well we all have our priorities yeah so and then <laughs> be it was someone short- that wants to be with you <laughs> yeah Exactly. So she she basically told him it was like you were just kind of there, because essentially, yeah. I mean, she does refer to him as a wiener too. At one point, it's one of the most quotable lines. Virtual <laughs> such an eighties in an eighties cut down. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I had to rewind that part. I was like, did did she just call him a wiener? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Sure enough, <laughs> Virgil, you wiener. <laughs> just waiting for the. Uh... Uh, Lambda, Lambda, Lambda guys to be like, hey, don't make fun of us. <laughs> but <laughs> we're, we're joking about it, but they had they have that argument, and part of the scene ends with um, Ed Harris, Bud, Virgil, whatever you would call him. Um, they kind of call him both in the movie. He throws his wedding ring in one of the chemical toilets, and then proceeds to turn around and fish it back out. And the rest of the movie, if you pay attention. The hand he reached in the toilet with is blue. And I love that because I don't think a lot of people know that. And I don't think that I ever noticed it either. Yeah, I I I did not ever notice that. Because I would really like to like all of the blue hands. Yeah, the rest of the movie after that scene, that hand and forearm are blue from the chemical toilet. (laughs) That's... That's a that's a really good continuity thing. Like I, uh, most movies would just glance over that. Oh, he washes hands. He's fine. He, he's uh, he's, that he's good. He does not wash out. <laughs> you can't wash chemicals off your hands. I've seen I'm I've seen too. Jackass yeah. one through four. Chemical toilet stuff does not just wash out. <laughs> did yes. you catch? No, did you not. catch that at all, Josh? I did, and it's like it's very prevalent too. Like there's a scene in particular where, like she's like laying down and like the the camera angles is to where like it's like his right side that you can see it very prevalently but yeah i did see it because it was black throughout the it was black and blue pretty much throughout the rest of the movie moving forward yeah but yeah they had they had i mean the the movie with all of its sci-fi and and tension and suspense ultimately ends up being if you like really want to boil it down, it almost ends up being a love movie. Yeah, it's a love story, you know. And I think um, speaking to the mental health aspect, I think that overall, I mean, and we discussed it enough. It it is it 
it portrays a healthy relationship at the end of the day. I mean, yeah, they had their issues, but they at least knew take time apart. And then at the end, they come back together and they work through some stuff. And I don't know. I think that that's important. Sometimes a healthy relationship means that you have to know when to kind of step away and do what you need to do. Right. And like, that's something that like, I think we, we gloss over a lot of times in, in movies like this, especially like big, sci-fi blockbusters like the abyss to where it's like oh hey these these this couple is is having issues and they're just gonna get divorced and go their separate ways whereas you kind of see them essentially having to work through and learn how to trust one another again and i think that that is absolutely is the the best thing that you can do because sometimes you know when I think in most states we there's a there's a period of separation uh, where you have to be separated from a spouse before you can legally file for a divorce. And that year, sometimes uh, my aunt actually like separated from her husband. They spent about a year apart and then ended up getting back together. And so like sometimes it, it does end up on like happy notes, and sometimes you know you you get uh, you get the you get divorced and, but you have that, you have that separation time to see if, you know, do I really, does, do I really miss this person? Does my heart grow fonder in the absence or, you know, how, how is my mental health without this person? Yeah. And I've, I've actually been through a divorce, so it ain't no joke mentally. It's, it's rough. Um, do what? I have as well. Yeah. (laughs) Your divorce. Yeah, it's it's very rare that you see an amicable divorce where both of them are like, you know what, we're just not going to work this out. Have a good day. You always, somebody's getting drugged through the mud. And it's just, it's it's a rough experience. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a nuclear sub where you need two keys. You can have <laughs> one person just turn it and go, nope, we're done. Yep. Uh, and the other person's kind of left holding the bag. Uh, it. And that is right. And it's, it, I mean, it's the movie definitely kind of shows that too, but it also, it deals with some pretty uh, uh, other heavy uh, mental health issues with Michael Bain being, I don't remember how to pronounce his name. I know he's said it before, but his character literally goes uh, insane from basically, I guess yeah. the bends, I mean, effectively. It's something akin to space madness. It's called um, pressure. high pressure room or something like a hpns and it basically is just like a uh neurological because i guess of the pressure so yeah. maybe i mean maybe akin to the bends but yeah. but and what's interesting is like the other navy seals are still listening to him like everybody can tell this 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 guy's not well like he's there's something wrong they were warned at the beginning of the movie this can happen you never know who it's gonna be you, you just find out and they're still like, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll we'll still follow him. Well, not completely. The the medic seal started questioning him about everything, yeah. and slowly started helping them on the other side. Um, kind of like when he's he's got the uh, nuke on on the Merv getting ready to drop it and send it down into the trench. Um, he pulls the gun on Ed Harris and goes to shoot it, and it's empty. And you see the medic pull out the magazine and start flipping the bullets into the ground where he had unloaded his gun. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So they they proactively knew how to handle a situation that in close quarters, would it have been worse to hide the gun? Of course it would have been, because then he would have freaked out and, you know, done something else. But he had the gun and he had that in his mental state, he had that kind of like I got a gun, you know, and yeah. didn't have to think about the bullets, you just assume the bullets were there. So they had the wherewithal to say, all right, this dude's off his nut right now. Let him have this gun, yeah. you know, empty it. So nobody's going to get hurt. Yeah, it's, it's but it, I, I think there's, uh, I took it as there's a little bit more to it where you have characters, you have people that, you know, they're in positions of power and they really believe that they're strong and that they don't have any weakness. And kind of introducing that is, Hey, this can happen to anybody, and it doesn't matter how strong, how trained you are, or anything else like that. Everybody's got, you know, everyone has yeah. a weakness, and he just couldn't see it. He he literally couldn't see it. Yeah. Um, but some of his subordinates wouldn't let themselves see it either. The the, the medic did, but not everybody else. Like yeah. you you can kind of tell. 
So some people just kind of, it's like mob mentality. They just kind of go with that flow. I know it's an ocean movie. I'm not trying to make a pun, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they, they did. They're like, oh yeah, 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 sure. Drop a nuke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we should do that. We should, we should just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, situations like that are, are kind of really terrifying to be in because here you have a, a, a guy that essentially holds the power to kaboom. Right. Yep. Yeah. So uh, you have to kind of like straddle the line between like being able to like save everyone in the in the crew, but also at the same time being able to make sure that he is healthy and gets the help that he needs. And that's True. also, uh, you know, to kind of step away from the, the ocean analogy, that's also a really hard spot to be in with, uh, you know, people going through suicide as well, like or like even addiction. Uh, at certain ages because you know in some areas you have like uh, I just recently had a had a friend that like wasn't sure if uh, they were their significant other was actually going to kill themselves or you know and so sometimes you know is it is it crying out for help or is it this actual like I need to get you safe so you walk this like tightrope kind of thing for for a lot of things yeah they they would have been as far as this is concerned it's medic how do i say this it was a a situationally induced mental yeah. issue as opposed yeah. to like a chemical imbalance or some sort of significant diagnosable mental illness how would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools conventions and other events well now you can simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as one dollar a month you guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health suicide and depression and you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else and you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover and we'll do it all it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode pick your tier and get started today yes it's that simple so quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today Well, that goes against what, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say Lindsay's character does, does bring up at one point, Hey, you need to look out for this. Um, Almost like some of the crew may not have been aware that it could have been a thing. Um, So that was just kind of, I mean, I'm sure that that was for the audience, I'm sure, but just to put it out there um, so that when it happened, it, it could be that maybe some of the crew was assuming that it was a chemical imbalance. You know, but either way, they got, well, you know. At the same time, Lindsay was almost the opposition to uh, Michael Bine, or however we're saying his last name, his character. They <laughs> were it, essentially the same type of character. They both needed to be in control, in charge and in control of everything. Right. So that you had one that lost it and one that didn't and both of them were fighting for control of the whole situation Mm -hmm. i get that we're on the heavier heavier side of the conversation now but his the character's name is coffee coffee yes yeah something he shouldn't be drinking anymore he needs to get a layout the caffeine (laughs) or whatever yeah. I mean, I'm I'm sitting here. I was like, "What was his name in the movie?" I know Hippie. I know Catfish, Virgil, and Bud, and Lindsay. And... <laughs> okay. While we're while we're talking about names, I, I have to know: Does anybody know why uh, Kimberly? What, what was her name? Kimberly Scott, the the I guess the only other female. Um, why was she called One Night? Her last name's Standing. One uh, Night it? Standing. Stop it! Is that why? Oh, I can get that. Okay. So, you know, yeah. uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. There you go. Okay. It's the eighties. Buckle up. We're on for a ride. So yeah, she's named one night standing. 
that could go <laughs> anyway. Yes. Okay, thank you. That clears that up. No problem. <laughs> Sorry, um, we ruined your serious moment. <laughs> no, you're you're good, man. Uh, I ruined it myself by bringing up coffee. So, <laughs> uh, Mark, I'm gonna let you you captain this ship, man, because this is your favorite movie. So, where are we going next? I mean, we've all talked. We spent more time talking about the production of the movie than the movie itself. Which, if you rewatch it after knowing all this, like even the little aliens were friggin' models. They they were animatronics. Um, you might have a different appreciation for it. Again, this is this is Night Watch all over again. I can appreciate <laughs> this movie. <laughs> And never have to watch it again. The, Day watch is coming, I promise. You, you, you literally have captured everything I've said about Midsummer. I appreciate everything that went into it, but I don't <laughs> watch it again. <laughs> and the funny thing is, like I said, I have the director's cut of The Abyss. I've also got one of the director's cut of Midsummer in there on my shelf. And you really can hate the boyfriend more. The, uh, <laughs> He's I'm gonna not. Be, I'm going to be super quiet because if I chime in, we're going to talk about Midsummer for three hours. So I'm not going to. I'm just going to stop. Small <laughs> aside, you can't root for a guy getting raped in a movie. I'm sorry, Midsummer <laughs> tries to make you root for it and make you laugh at it. It's terrible. Oh, this it's is just very awful. uncomfortable. I'm. It really I'm right is. There with you, Rob. It's I'm sorry. so uncomfortable. There are so many times I, I've never been more uncomfortable in a movie theater than I was watching Midsommar. I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah. I and you're three times in the theater. Three. <laughs> I, I have a painting from it right above my head. And every time I look at it, it's freaking insane. But it, no, it's, it, it's weird how some of these movies and the abyss does too, can, can kind of make light of these issues. Um, because I don't, the abyss doesn't really uh, take coffee seriously. Like, I mean, the audience knows what's going on. It's not like they're, you know, they're, and they're not worried about him. He's just written off as basically the villain. The way I take it is, okay, he's the bad guy now. And, and that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, but really he needed help. Like this, this is not his fault. He can't (laughs) control what is happening to him. Um, and his own men let him down. Like they were warned about it ahead of time. This could happen to anybody. You need to be on the lookout for this. This just starts happening. You need to take care of this. And they just don't. They're just like, oh, cool. Yeah, give him a nuke. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and nuke a trench. That makes sense. <laughs> um, some of them were were stopping, but they weren't they weren't doing what they were supposed to do, which is uh, you know, restrain him, t- take, take, take the power away from him. And get him out of the situation as fast as possible, because that could have caused long-term damage if he hadn't have died. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Him. Well, all right, like on that note, like you're absolutely right. Like it's it's really cringy to me when you go back and you watch movies from like the '90s, like down, even like the 2000s down, because when you're you're handling mental illness, it's always like you try to vilify it the individual that has the mental illness or as we've kind of talked about like the situational uh illness you know he's kind of a guy that's almost uh bordering like this mental breakdown and you know we another great example of this from another cinema would be uh jack torrance from the shining uh and you know that i think is again like you were saying rob like he he's taken off and been like written off as a villain, not necessarily someone as uh, needing uh, to, to be heroes or not, uh, not to be heroes, but to be treated and to kind of be like sought after and looked after. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of that also comes from the way that we, uh, the way that men are treated in society when it comes to mental illness, because there's this, there's been this long stigma that a, you don't talk about your, your feelings as men and B you uh if you do undergo issues like what coffee does you're just kind of man up like those those are the two words that you're kind of met with and for coffee 
know, again, it's just there's this this automatic 180 where he's now the bad guy because he's experiencing these things he can't control. Now, is it that he's the bad guy because of what's going on, or is he the bad guy because of the situation that's caused because of it? I would say the movie makes him the bad guy. I, I would say it's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B from, from your question. I, I mean, they didn't. Oh, go ahead, please. To go with Rob's point, though, they, they do put duct tape in like space stations for a reason. And I'm pretty sure I saw some duct tape in the movie in multiple occasions. So they had plenty of chance to restrain him. But you also had to deal with the his his uh, SEAL cohorts that were following orders. And they made comments off and on through the movie where it wasn't apparent to everybody that he was losing it till somebody noticed the tremors in his hand and it was brought up, hey, did you notice this? No. And it wasn't apparent to everybody. It just kind of built through the movie as more and more were noticing it. Which would be true with some people with mental illness and things like that where friends and family just didn't see the warning signs until it was too late so yeah. maybe in that case it's more realistic that i'm giving it credit for yeah i know i would also say that there's a lot of ignorance surrounding that uh like you know we don't talk about warning signs of you know depression anxiety and kind of meeting those at their bedrock so that they don't manifest into things like addiction self-harm and suicide and like you said, Josh, it's not, it's not something that any man has been allowed to really talk about. So these other characters by just kind of going along with it or whatever, they're, they're just kind of allowing him to just be a character or not a character, uh, um, in a position of power still without having to kind of answer for something that might you know could potentially be wrong if they if they admit even that he has this whatever it's called the high pressure nervous center of thing if they admit that he has that well then that's kind of in their heads probably the same as admitting that he might have some kind of a, a mental high, illness and I, probably none of them were allowed to do that i've got the name high pressure nervous syndrome yes uh, h p n s they call it which apparently is a real thing it wasn't just made for the movie it's not unobtainium it's a real thing <laughs> stop it and it, it's <laughs> apparently it's got nothing to do with that it's all about helium because you know divers take they switch out oxygen for helium because uh, yeah. they can go to lower pressures but apparently you can get a neurological disorder from that which is this thing which would make sense because the rig would probably have a helium a very similar mix being that deep to begin with. But none of them talked with a high pitched voice. So I'm going to call BS on that and say <laughs> that Same. the movie would have been so much better if they're all talking like the chipmunks. <laughs> you wiener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Still the best line in the movie. <laughs> I, I I'm just like somebody somebody wrote that in the script. Like James Cameron wrote that in the script, and it's like, yeah, yeah, this is what a professional woman is going to resort to. She's not going to call him a dick. She's going to call him a wiener. But she is talking to her ex. She would use way more colorful language. Oh, absolutely, one hundred percent. Oh. I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's like, oh, well, we got to let kids see this movie. Okay. Uh, so she needs to say something along the lines of Wolfman's got nards. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. We'll just, we'll dumb it down. I mean, it was PG 13, wasn't it? Yeah. So they're allowed to say some words. Well, I mean, they were also allowed to smoke in the movie too and still be PG 13. So you could be PG <laughs> if you have smoking. There were boobies. <laughs> 80s is a wonderful, lawless place for movies. <laughs> They've actually, so it, it's funny when you look at movie ratings and the way they do them now compared to then. There's a lot of movies now 
that would have been rated R back then for certain things, but there's like PG and PG 13 movies from the eighties that would now be rated R. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very true. It's bonkers. So yeah. just to get something behind the scenes, because this is something that PETA would have freaked out about. Do you know the little rat scene when it's oh, the one that they killed and, multiple times during taping? Well, here's the thing. That was actually highly oxygenated water that yeah. that, or that didn't actually kill the rat. It At least not pneumonia. that take. Yeah, it, <laughs> it did. But it freaked out when it started breathing the liquid, you know, like any animal or human would being would do and it started yeah. pooping in the water so they cut away from it but apparently like a, they got like these duke students who were testing this like i i thought this was made up for the movie you know this idea of breathing water this was a real thing like they were really looking to see if they could do this yeah well, so they they, did it with, with, well like you said they did it with the rats and with the pooping and they had to cut away in uh, the UK, they cut that scene because the rat was so distressed and pooping that that was deemed to be, you know, cruel. Like you said, Peter would freak out. But um, well, and I mean, then that's why they never that, tested it on humans. That's why Ed uh, had to pretend almost you know, die. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, you had what Milo and Otis come out, and how many times did they kill the animals and had to get replacements for the taping of that movie? I did I not know this. I you made a ruin that, that Milo a and Otis yeah, for me. Yeah, no, that that's that's a that's a family film for me. I grew I grew up with that. Nothing bad happened to those animals. I bet even though it was almost thirty years ago, I bet those animals are still alive. <laughs> they're still they're still kicking around. Yeah, they're not it's, dead. Uh, it's things like that and the rat scene in the abyss that certain regulations were made because animals were dying in production. Yeah. Cannibal Holocaust. Um, that was a real tortoise. They took open or a turtle or whatever. I, it was. Di I did know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, the horse scene in Apocalypse Now. That was a real horse. That village so butchered. It's, and I guess they justified it by feeding the village afterwards with these critters. But still, yeah. I can't. I can watch the films. I just can't watch those scenes. I it, yeah. It's so weird how films could do this. So one of the most interesting facts I've ever learned about. Uh, movies is uh, back in the I think it was the 30s or 40s they did a filming of Noah's Ark and there's a scene where basically all the people get swept away and drowned and they were like yeah we can do like little claymation miniatures and stuff like that and that's no big deal and the director's like nah we're gonna we're gonna get real people and they're like no 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 you're not gonna do that like yeah we're gonna we're gonna get real people and they flooded this one area didn't tell the people what was going to happen. All these extras, I think at least seven people drowned. One of Ooh. them who almost drowned was an extra in a movie and uh, eventually became actor John Wayne. <laughs> he almost really? died before his career ever took off because the director didn't care. They just wanted a scene of a bunch of people drowning. I mean, I would like to think because of that film and The Abyss, <laughs> that there were some safety measures put in place for these poor actors because didn't Ed Harris have a hard time with that scene where you said they were dragging him around? Yeah, he almost he died. He punched head. James Cameron over it. I, I think yeah. he actually bonked his head. I mean, <laughs> these poor... Yeah, I don't know. It makes well, me anxious. James Cameron almost died during filming, too. Yeah. He was in an, a lower area, and his, uh, there was a diver assisting him and his assistant director, and they weren't helping him. So finally, he punches one of them to get out, passes out, and when he wakes up, he fires the two of them. Mm. <laughs> so, so at least the actors weren't the only ones to almost die. The, the, the director <laughs> did, too. So, you know, this was just a, a blessed production. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will yeah. still watch this movie fairly regularly. Sure, I don't want to take that away from me. I really don't. I, I'm not fair, trying to dude. say like you're terrible for watching this film. How could you? No, you like what you like. The, the viewing pleasure for me because now I want to see the extended version. I want to see the look on Ed Harris's face. I mean, I remember him looking fairly terrified, but that's real. So I want to see that. Yeah. Now. 
so you can find the special edition online like I have um, and they're like 10, 20 bucks and it's got both the theatrical cut and the director's cut on the same disc. Okay. Oh, but if it's not an HD, I, I can't. I just, I, I can't. I, I have needs... a, I have a really good blue, uh, 4K Blu-ray player and a really nice TV and it didn't look that bad for being a DVD because oh, of the no, upscaling. <laughs> So I mean, I have VHSs still, so. <laughs> but that's that's become its own little niche thing, like like records. There's lots of people doing that now. I I've Look. got a record player right next to me. I want a record player. I just nice. have a small house. Uh, well, uh, thank you guys so much for joining us to talk about the abyss. Where can people find the fright stuff online? You can find the Fright Stuff on Twitter at the Fright Stuff. You can also find us on Facebook at the Fright Stuff Pod. We have an Instagram, but I, yeah, doesn't see as much traffic. So don't worry about that. It's true. Just come um, find us at the other places, and we'll we'll amuse you there. Yeah, and you can find the podcast on all your favorites. Uh, we use Anchor, so it spreads yeah. them out to everywhere. Apple, wherever you, you know, iTunes, whatever. Everywhere. And uh, I am going to, you guys have fallen for the trap. So uh, here's something that you guys might not know about Robin and Lori was that Robin and Lori were actually at our first ever uh, film festival, Horrific Hope. We were. Where Rob apparently almost threw up from watching Hatching several times, <laughs> several times. <laughs> that was not just once. Uh, go check out their episode on Mandy to hear why. But I want to know. I want to hear from you guys. Uh, tell our listeners why they should uh, give this festival a chance when it comes back to the Alamo in 2023. Yes. Um, can I go first, Rob? Because I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I love film festivals anyhow, and I was super excited to learn about this one because not only do I get to sit and watch amazing shorts, and amazing films, but it had a really good message because I think that mental health is always something that needs to be talked about. Um, I loved that the films were curated to kind of, um, to, to kind of highlight it, but it was also you know, films that I love, horror and just gross out things. And, but it always brought you back like there, I don't remember the name of the film, but it was one of the features with the girl that just, it was just one girl. And um, was she called? was the actress. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about acting. Is that what it was called? It mm -hmm. made me so uncomfortable. I really, which was the point. But um, just in some of the buzz that I heard, a lot of people were like, I didn't really like that one so much. But when I thought about why this film festival exists, I was like, you know, come on. That one was just, it was, it was perfect. Um, but any chance that I get to sit in a theater for a day and see all these films that I would never otherwise have a chance to see, um, you know, just either because I wouldn't have known about them or just have a hard time finding them it's just amazing and so much freaking talent just from all over the world and to actually get to meet some of the people who made the films too there weren't a lot of them there but yeah it's i, I love it i liked the selection um i've gone to a couple of um film festivals at the alamo um and i i felt this one had one of the better selections um you you all really seem to actually look for films and and, and I, I, this, this is going to sound so bad you look for films that actually were good and you weren't just putting up whatever was added we went to um one and i'm not i'm not hating on it because i had fun it was called grind exploitation i liked it it was moved mm. up from tennessee but there were some choices i'm like y you didn't watch this ahead of time like you can't tell me <laughs> you liked this um but all the shorts were really good i actually other than hatching which i felt was the the highlight of of the thing no matter what it did to me um <laughs> i i love the movie i love the shorts more than the movies and the shorts were so well done there were some um that 
like I went like online to like look again so I could see. I I really liked it. Um, I also liked that your inter- you had interviews with uh, of the people that were able to come and make the movies. You were able to show, and you also sh- you did show. Um, let me let me backtrack one second. Um, you did show a movie that I I love a lot, which is a ghost story, uh, or a ghost a ghost waits. Yeah, oh, okay. ghost waits. Oh my god, Adam's gonna kill me. <laughs> uh, I didn't. I didn't mean to get the title wrong. Um, I've seen that movie probably about five or six times. That makes me cry every time. Um, I know yeah, we, for a fact he was very touched to be there and very yeah. excited. He's such a good guy. Um, we we actually did a a podcast with what was, what was his name? Was it Adam? Adam. Adam yeah, Adam Stovall. It was yeah. Adam Stovall. Yep, he did uh, did Fire in the Sky with us. You guys can check him out. And he was also on the. Victims and Villains, Pam and Tommy review as well. Great guy. Yeah, he, I, I'm bad with names and have a bad memory, so that's don't blame me. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I love the movie too, but but hatching was new for me, and and I loved it. But so, and that's the other thing. You didn't just have like older films and stuff like that. You you chose cl- some local uh, uh, local film uh, people too, and it was they were just great. It was fun. Um, I. I was sad that it wasn't longer and it wasn't like a whole weekend. Um, so I guess we'll see what happens in 2023. Hopefully we get like a, like a full weekend. That'd be great. Um, uh, there but no, I, I liked it. Conversations. I will say that. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, but no, I, I thought you did well. I didn't even know it was your first one. That's actually surprising yeah. to me that it was your first time because I've been to others that have been going on forever. And I don't think that they were as organized as yours was not at all. When you, when you run press or when you when you work press for film festivals you learn how to uh kind of understand the ins and outs so a lot of any questions that i had the alamo was really great about like answering them and like so um laurie to your point like we wanted to make sure we were having blocks that were specifically (laughs) designed to address uh, mental health concerns, whether that's uh, female empowerment on which we did it all Friday or um, understanding that you can, you know, mental illnesses are hereditary. So using hatching as a, as a block to talk specifically about uh, heretical film, uh, heretical mental illness and, and stuff like that as well. Um, you know, we really wanted to make it as, as fun as it was. Um, and, Thank you, Rob. I, I really worked my butt off, man. I, I we can tell. He, he I did. will. We, we, the group of us that, that kind of help would get off and on. Hey, go check this movie out. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence for these reasons. <laughs> did y'all check it out yet? Damn it! I told y'all to check this out. So, <laughs> so he put in a lot of work to organize everything. Um, I didn't help as much as I wanted to uh because of personal reasons but he did a pretty good job getting it all together in the end but uh i will i have a couple more questions i'll ask off air just so uh but anyways uh you guys can uh find our parent company victims and villains we're on facebook instagram twitter twitch youtube wherever you guys get your podcasts from uh we're also on patreon where you guys can help support us get mental health resources into conventions film festivals and like all of which you guys can find in the links below along with links to our mental health resource library uh and you guys can uh speaking of the film festival submissions are now open so whether you guys have shorts screenplays or features that link is going to be in the show notes below as well you guys can follow me i am on letterbox at captain nostalgia mark send us off where can people find you my friend i just paint miniatures and be a nerd on instagram at titanium juggernaut painting (laughs) i paint miniatures for war games that's awesome yeah i'm actually sitting at my desk right now for that Uh, well, until next time, remember that the longer you gaze into the abyss, the more the abyss gazes back into you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.